Thank you, Floralise. That was beautiful. It's nice to see everybody today. I know it's raining outside, but come on, people. It's, uh, I think a few more of our members stayed home to watch online, given the thunderstorm maybe today, but that's okay. That's why we have it, but it's for those of you that brave the raindrops. We're glad that you're here. We hope you had a good week, and we hope that uh, you've been blessed so far today. We are celebrating women today. It's Mother's Day weekend, and we're celebrating all of our ladies in the church. And so we want to make sure all of you leave with a flower on your way out today if you haven't already gotten one. We want you to know that you're loved and appreciated and uh, that you're cared for here in our church. So we want to make sure you leave with that reminder. And today's message is on that theme. It's called The Song for Eve. And uh, women have gotten a bad rep when it comes to the Bible. We'll talk about that a little bit more, and we will talk about how God tells us that he sees women. It's a lot different than what most people think the Bible says about women. So before we study, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus, our Savior. He's been lifted up in song and scripture and prayer today, and now we want him to be lifted up in the spoken word. So we pray that your spirit would be here with us. Send us your love, send us openness of mind and heart so that you can be praised and glorified. And we may know more about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, it is in fact true that in certain times and in certain cultures, women have been mistreated and those records are in Scripture. We can't deny that. We have record of abuse, we have record of mistreatment and degradation of the female gender, and the Bible does record that. That does not necessarily... No, that not. I'm going to take the word necessarily out of there at all. That doesn't mean that's how God sees women, though. We need to be very crystal clear on that. The Bible has historical record of all kinds of things throughout the eras, the ages, that God is not responsible for. It's just a record of how people lived, some of the things that they did, some of the attitudes and behaviors that they had. But if we want to see God's true intentions, we go to two sources, Jesus himself and Eden. Amen? Those are the two sources to, to get God's true intentions and his will. Of course, there's words of others, but sometimes those words of others, uh, like Paul, they can be hard to understand in the historical context. But if you want to see a clear picture of what God has always intended, you go to Eden or you go to Jesus. It's dangerous to believe that the Bible gives women a bad reputation because, as we said, it should not be attributed to God, but sinful humans when women have been mistreated. It couldn't be further from the truth that God has a lesser view of the female gender. In fact, we're going to hear today that the female gender should be celebrated and honored and cherished. We're going to debunk some common myths today that involve women in Scripture and show that God values them deeply. And when women are abused and disrespected, it is disrespecting God. And when men abuse and disrespect women, they're actually disrespecting themselves as well. Let's dig in. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Right back to the beginning, the Genesis story. By the way, for those of you that are, will be attending our seminar on biblical sexuality next Sabbath, our Sabbath school teachers, our elders, that's where we're starting with this, some of this is going to be familiar next week because it plays into, uh, plays into our study next week. But that's not our focus this week. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man. There it is, Pastor C. God always wanted to make men. Eh, wrong. That word man is actually the word mankind. It's the word for mankind. Kind. Let us make mankind in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created mankind in his own image. The image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Why is the male gender always referenced? Why does this say mankind and then him? Here's the reason. 
it was proper Old English to refer to an unknown gender or plural genders in the male. Is that clear to everybody? That's how proper English worked back in past generations. It doesn't mean that God is uplifting one gender over another when he's talking about the creation of, of humans. Are we clear on that? That's just the way it was done and referred to. God blessed them in verse 28. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let me ask you this question. Is it clear from Genesis 1 that it was always God's intention to make women? Yes or no? Is it clear from Genesis chapter 1 that women are made in the image of God? Yes or no? undisputable, undeniable. Women were not made as an afterthought because Adam was lonely. We're going to talk more about that here in just a few minutes. Women were made in the image of God. You'd be surprised at how many cultures and how many churches that's never openly stated. Women are made in the image of God. Now some of you are going, oh no, Pastor Hall's saying God is a woman. You're all full of nonsense if you're starting to think that way. If you think that God has an assigned human gender, you are very small-minded. People get caught up in these debates and these ideologies. Oh, God's friends. God is infinite, he's holy, he's spirit, he's fire, he is something beyond the comprehension and cognition of human minds. Don't limit him to something that is limited to male and female here on earth. What we're saying here is that in fact, God says, let, them, let mankind be made in our image and let them have dominion. The most direct way mankind is made in the image of God is the way that we were to relate to creation. To think that we physically look like God is to have a very small mind. Now, maybe in some ways, somehow, we kind of physically look like God. But if you think that the infinite creator of the universe is limited to some physical body with some physical gender, come on, people, think bigger. Think bigger. It's the way we were to relate to each other and to relate to creation that most specifically describes how we were made in the image of God. Does that make sense to everybody? That's why he immediately says, let them have dominion. That, that's specifically what God is saying, how we're made in his image. He set us as kings and queens over creation. Just like he is king over the whole universe, we were to be kings and queens over over this newly created planet. Isn't that an amazing thing? Women were made in the image of God. Women were made in the image of God. Remember that. Never forget that. I was, going, I was doing a, a uh, mission trip in another country, and I did a sermon similar to this one because I knew in that country that it was expected that men would have affairs. In fact, you are not a real man if you didn't step out on your wife in this country. There are still some countries in this world where that is expected. It is just expected that it's part of the male persona to have multiple girlfriends, even though you're married. And, and I preached this sermon and I said, women are made in the image of God. And this woman came up to me and she was in tears and she said, Pastor, I have never heard anyone say that from the pulpit, that women are made in the image of God. None of you can ever say that now. Women are made in the image of God. The female gender should be celebrated, cherished, and loved because there are parts of what God did in the female gender that reflect who he is. God did a wonderful and amazing thing when he made women. Made in his image. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 because we get more details of God's intentions and in parts of this story in Genesis chapter 2 beginning in verse 15. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took man, this time it's literally man, but also mankind, but specifically Adam, man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in that day you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let's back up here for just a second. Let me ask you this question. Was Adam full and complete as a human being before Eve was created? Yes or no? I'm going to ask that again because it's important. Was You were right, by the way, those of you that answered. Was Adam a full and complete human being before Eve was created? Yes or no? Absolutely. Jerry Maguire was lying to us. You complete me. No. No human being is created to complete you. God's math is one person, one whole person created by Him, plus one whole person created by Him, put together makes one whole person. It's not half of a person plus half of a person equals one person. The term soulmate you never find anywhere in the Bible. The term other half is never found in the Bible and you never find those concepts ever written of in the Bible. If you think another human being can complete you, you are destined to fail in your relationships. Eve was not created to complete Adam. More on that later. You know where the idea of soulmates comes from? I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again. It's the Greeks. The Greeks, and you can read of this in Plato, his book Romance. It's called Romance. It's on love, and they discuss different parts of love and what love is and what love means. The book on romance states this. This is what the Greeks believed. The Greeks believed that mankind was created with two heads, four arms, and four legs. When one day man got quite arrogant mankind got quite arrogant and they decided that they were going to climb up Mount Olympus and they were going to throw Zeus off of his throne and they were going to take his place so to curse mankind Zeus cut humans in half ever cursing us to search for our soul mate or our other half It's Greek, it's not biblical. God says the two, man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one. This idea that another person can complete you or make you whole is devilish ideology. Do you know why? Because if you're searching for someone to complete you, you make an idol out of that person. You know what I'm saying? You understand that? You're hoping that someone, somewhere, somehow, can finally complete who you are. And you'll feel complete and whole and loved and cared for. And and you put all this pressure, and this is what breaks up marriages. This person no longer pleases me or satisfies me or makes me feel whole, so must be I didn't marry my soulmate. You hear this all the time, don't we? I didn't marry my soulmate because this person doesn't, it doesn't feel like this person completes me anymore. And so we break up marriages. No human was ever made or designed, and it was never God's intention for a person to complete us. We need to understand that. Adam is complete and whole and totally a man without a woman. Here's the thing, guys. Women were not made as objects to please you. Women were made in God's image. They are not objects made to please you. In fact, what we need to see very clearly in verse 18, who says that it's not good for man to be alone? Verse 18. And the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. Adam didn't say it. There is not one shred of biblical evidence to back up the idea that Adam was lonely or felt incomplete in Eden before Eve. 
Not one shred of biblical evidence. You cannot find it anywhere. It's not there. It's God who says it. It's God who says it. Let's think about this. Do you really think Adam would feel lonely in perfect Eden? Perfect Eden. Walking and talking face to face with God. You want to tell me Adam's going, oh, so lonely. You know, this is, life is just incomplete. I have no, no, God is walking beside him. He's talking, God is explaining creation to him. He's, he's taking him through all of the wonders of creation and explaining to him why he made it. That This is the experience of Adam. He's not lonely, but God says it's not good for man to be alone because God has more to teach Adam. Romans chapter 1 tells us that the deep things of God can be clearly understood through the things that he has made. The deep things of God can be clearly understood through the things that he has made. In other words, everything God created was for the purpose of understanding him better. Does that make sense to you, yes or no? Now go back, rewind. Man and woman were made in the image of God. The reason God creates Eve isn't to please Adam or because his needs and desires were not fulfilled. God creates Eve because the picture of God in humanity was incomplete. The picture of God was incomplete without women because God made women in his image. You with me on that, yes or no? God had more to teach Adam, so he made woman. It's not good for man to be alone because ah, there's more to teach, there's more to learn, there's more to understand about him. Adam had a job. Adam was secure in life. And then God brought a woman in his life. Tell me where I'm wrong. That's exactly what that said. God made him. God worked with him. God made him whole. God gave him a job. He was working. And then the Lord brought him a woman in his life to teach him more, not to fulfill him, not to take care of him, not to provide for him. No, he was complete and whole. This ideology that we search for a mate, we search for someone to complete us or make us whole, is wrong. We need to be complete and whole in Jesus, don't we? Content? Now, here's the thing. Life is a hard road. We all have weaknesses and we all have strengths. No denying that. And our, our stories are all different. But the ideology that we need to find someone to make us complete and whole is not from the Lord. He makes us whole. Only He can make us complete. Amen? Only Him. Only He can make us complete. And, and I'll, I'll say this. Men and women were made in His image. Men and women were, were put together to teach humanity more about Him. Here's the thing. God created those relationships not primarily for pleasure. He created them primarily so that we may experience and understand better who He is. And pleasure is the byproduct of knowing Him better. So here's the amazing thing, friends. The reason that we long for a partner is because we're longing for the experience that will bring us closer to God. We just don't know it. You following me there, yes or no? What we long for in a human mate is actually what we're screaming for from God. Intimacy, love, to be completely known, to be completely accepted, to be vulnerable, to be loved even in our weakest moments. Isn't that what we long for in a mate? That's actually what we should be looking for in God. And when we find that acceptance and that love in Him first, then our hearts are better prepared to add another human to our lives. But the world teaches us neediness, loneliness, desperation, and lust. 
In those things we seek a spouse. In those things we seek our identity. And it's the wrong place. And this is the pressure that humans have been putting, men have been putting on women. Even the idea that women were made to please men comes from a place of sexism. Because you don't find it in the Bible. It's nowhere there. Now, verse 18 is very interesting. As we look at that again, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. For him. Now, that interesting, the word is interesting. For. It's misunderstood when you think it's an object to give to Adam. The word for there is better translated as corresponding to or like unto. So in other words, what God is saying there is, let me give him a helper corresponding to himself. Let me create a helper that is like him. Not for him, not an object to be owned or dominated, but someone who is like him or is his equal. And Adam understands this because Eve is taken from his rib. Eve is not created from a foot bone or a backbone. She's not to be below him or behind him. She's created from a rib to stand beside him. And the word woman, it's an interesting word. It's ish. Ish in the Hebrew. And the word for man is isha'a. Isha'a. So the word woman is actually the first part of the word man. And that's why he says, this woman is flesh in my flesh and bone in my bone. This woman has been taken from the man. It's a play on words. He realizes that she is his equal. She is exactly the same thing that he is. Not his lesser. Not to be dominated over him. or Not, not for her to be dominated over. But his equal to stand by him. Eve was created because the picture of God, the image of God, was incomplete. Humanity was made in the image of God, and you couldn't have a complete picture without women. Let me say this extremely explicitly to the men gathered here. When you degrade and dishonor women, not only do you sin, but you sin against God and yourself. Because Women are made in the image of God, and without women, men cannot fully understand who they are either. And I don't mean the fact that women are created to create your masculinity. I'm saying without the female gender, men would not even know what men are supposed to be, because women help us complete the picture of God's image in man. So when you degrade women or you use women or you exploit women, you are degrading the image of God in mankind. I love verse 21. Verse 21, for the Lord God... Sidebar, if I'm tugging at my clothes, I'm going to tell you why. Don't buy cheap t-shirt undershirts. This thing is twisting me up and so just just ignore it if I keep going like this. Ah. Oh, don't do that. My wife was in the store. See, this is why men also should listen to women. Um, my wife would say, "Don't buy the cheap ones. You're going to regret it." And here I am. Verse 21, let's get back on track here. Verse 21, I love this verse, I love it. Verse 21, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Let me ask you this question. Why did God do that? Why does God put Adam to sleep in order to create Eve? Did he have to do that? He didn't have to put him to sleep, did he? He didn't have to do it that way. 
You know why God does this? God created Adam and then spent time with Adam alone, didn't he? To teach Adam who he was. God puts Adam to sleep, so the first thing Eve sees is not Adam. The first thing Eve sees is her creator. And she finds her identity, her completion, her wholeness in him, and she put, he put that man to sleep. Her identity is not found in that man. Her identity is found in God. He spent time alone with her to help her know why he created her. She, too, is complete and whole in him. And it, this is why it completes the picture. Just like the Godhead, there are three persons in the Godhead who are fully God in and of themselves. But through their relationship, they also complete the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Each one independently God, but the human family also each independently a whole person, but through their relationship with one another, complete the human family. The human family was designed to picture the, the, the image of God. God created a human, quote unquote, human symbol of the Trinity. Each independently human, but together they represent God's image in man. The human family was to represent the Godhead. We were made in His image. Now, of course, we're not divine, and we can't be three in one and one in three, but He made us in His image, and He, he found out a human finite way to instruct us about His very character and who He is. Isn't that amazing? There's more that I could say, and there's more we'll say next week in our seminar. Gender is important. It's important. So the rib is the side bone. It, it, she was to stand beside Adam. She was complete in Christ, standing beside Adam. Not behind him, not below him. And also that rib protects vital organs. She was important to Adam. There's a little more to this, and I could say you can study this out on your own, but it's interesting that God calls Eve the helper. When Jesus said he's going away, he said, I'm going to send the helper. Jesus is the second Adam. The first Adam married his bride. If, and I'm using a big if here, if Eve is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, get this, check this picture out, it's pretty incredible. Jesus is the second Adam who marries the church who is his bride, who is full of the Holy Spirit. The bride of Christ, the bride of the second Adam is a people full of his spirit. Isn't that incredible? The pictures just keep unfolding and unfolding and unfolding of what his intentions were. God was laying out the plan of salvation. Verse 25 is also important. Actually, let's look at verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus repeats this in the book of Mark, I believe it is. And he says, the two, he's very specific, the two shall become one. You know why Jesus is so specific in those days? It's because the way women were being treated in those days. They were not treated as an equal. They were treated as an object. They were to be divorced if they burnt the dinner, and I'm not exaggerating on that. They were not considered the equal of man. They were considered the servant of man. And so Jesus, by saying the two shall become one, is affirming that women are made in his image, is affirming the equality of women with men. The two shall become one. And again, they are complete and whole in Christ. They are complete and whole in him. And the two whole beings become one whole being, just like God's image is three in one. Isn't that incredible stuff? Verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. This is about intimacy. Remember what we said? Literally 
everything in the Garden of Eden was created to know God better. Everything in the Garden of Eden was to know God better. Everything. You getting me? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. That wasn't just given to God, to human, humans for pleasure. It was given to humans by God to teach us more about the vulnerability, the intimacy, the love, and the compassion that the Godhead shares. It was a physical human act given as a gift to show the love that the persons of the Godhead share with one another. And what have we made it? We've made it all about how someone else makes me feel. We make women in particular, but women can do this too, we make objects out of each other. Objects. And when we make someone an object, we dehumanize them. And when we dehumanize them, we deny that they were created in the image of God. Are you with me? And when we deny that our partner is created in the image of God, we deny that we ourselves are created in the image of God. We need our partner to be lifted up and glorified as being made in the image of God for us to understand that we too are made in the image of God. Are you with me? When we degrade and we objectify women, men betray themselves because men need to understand that women were made in the image of God to understand that we also were made in the image of God. There is divine singleness. Divine singleness. Don't go around to our single people in this church making them feel like they're incomplete because they're not married and they don't have kids. Paul says it's a good thing to be single. Jesus said and God said in creation that you are complete and whole as a one person. You're not missing out on being made in the image of God because you're not married or you don't have kids. There is divine singleness. And we need to be understanding that we don't add someone in our life to make us feel better or make us feel whole. If God chooses to bring someone into our life, it's to teach us more. Married people, can you testify? Come on now. Marriage is for instruction. We get married with, oh, life is going to be so awesome and we're going to have so much happiness and fun and it's all going to be wonderful. Now, don't get me wrong, there are wonderful parts of it. But weigh the instruction versus the happiness and joyful parts. You know how you enjoy marriage? You get pleasure out of the instruction part. When you learn to enjoy what God is teaching you through marriage, you enjoy it all the more, which confirms what we were saying earlier. Marriage was not designed by God simply to please Adam. Eve was not made as an afterthought because Adam was lonely or, I'll use a big word so the kids don't understand, amorous. Eve was made because she was in the image of God. God has all, always had that intention to instruct humanity. The human race needed the female gender. We needed the female gender. God could have somehow figured out a way for men to procreate and fill the earth if he only liked men. He could have. He could have figured out a way to multiply and fill the earth with all a bunch of guys. What a boring place that would be. Too much grunting and bodily functions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We won't go there because I don't want to get in trouble. But yeah, 
God created Eve because the picture of God in humanity was incomplete. Women were made in the image of God. They weren't just made to please man. God's, and he uses the word knew. Adam knew his wife. They knew each other because that physical act was not just about babies and it wasn't just about pleasure. It was about intimacy. Complete vulnerability. Complete love. Complete acceptance. Being totally vulnerable in someone's presence. And isn't that exactly what we see when Jesus relates to the Father? Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. To be completely known and completely loved and completely accepted at your most vulnerable point. That's why God uses the word knew. They knew each other. Just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit know one another. Friends, the bottom line is this. Any mistreatment of women is sin. Any objectification, depiction, or misuse of women and their bodies or minds of any kind is sin. It's a sin against God, and it's a sin against ourselves. Because when we think of women that way, we misunderstand who we are too. When we mistreat women, it is to dishonor the image of God in ourselves. Without women, we cannot understand what it is to be made in the image of God. To dishonor women is to dishonor men. To push women down or hold them back is to deny that they too are made in the image of God. It is to deny that women were made in God's image. Women were not made to please men or to simply comfort their urges. They were fearfully and wonderfully made. To believe that women exist to simply please men is to degrade the entire human race. The first person that Jesus told that he was the Messiah, remember who that was? It was the woman at the well. A disgraced, lonely woman who had made a lot of bad decisions in her life. She was the first person he told that he was the Messiah. He wanted to restore her as a daughter of God and restore her dignity. Because what did she do? She went back to the town and told everybody who she'd met. He restored her soul because women are important to him. There was a woman who was caught in embarrassment, demon possession. She was being used by a man. Jesus stood in the way. He didn't condemn her, but he condemned the men and the man that was mistreating and misusing her. The first person to know that Jesus was risen from the dead was a woman. Scripture tells us that the most valuable thing in the world, it's clear over and over, Song of Solomon, the book of Proverbs, God says the most valuable thing in the entire world is a godly woman. More than riches or gems or pearls. The glue that holds together the lineage of Jesus as the king is women. Some disgraced women. But God put it in his genealogy because women are so important to him. When Jesus was dying on the cross... He made certain that his mother would be cared for. In all that pain and agony, Jesus made sure that his mother would be cared for. Women, despite how you have been viewed and treated by people, men, the circumstances and the time, God places infinite value on you and your gender 
let no one despise you because you are a woman. And I thank God that God has given me something more valuable than all the riches in the world. I love you. You are everything God knew I needed.